Okay, so I'll be talking about, um, I'd say, general purpose computation using precise timing. And I will show you what I mean by precise timing. I love precise timing not because it's a religion or I'm following, I'll tell you why. And I think I've, we've initiated all this thing with vision over a decade ago uh, from a starting point, and that is leading us slowly to another point. So I'll, really, I'll briefly go there. So in the past life, I did my PhD on building these type of sensors back in the 90s, where it's basically this, the idea was how do you build a camera that can see in all directions. And as you can see here, the image is so distorted. And this is nothing compared to more fancy eyes, basically. And the question over there was, back in the 90s, people were hoping to hammer math there. And nothing really worked, because you see distortions are here and nonlinearity all over the place. And, and so digging deeper and deeper, it seems obvious to me that the problem there was not the sensor, because it really copied the eye, is the image. The image is something that cannot make the system work, will never work. And, uh, and so started the quest of why on earth are we using images around you know, 1999. And it turns out that we are doing cameras today from this invention of the dark room, the camera obscura from 1544. This is Leonardo da Vinci's writing. This is a gravure. And basically, it's a dark room with a hole. Everybody did this in, when he's in elementary school. And you get the procession of the sun on this wall. So this is the mother of all cameras. And then it stayed as a curiosity until, of course, money came in. And painters start using it. You go from castle to castle, pay, paint royalty faster, and then move to the next castle and make more money, paint more faster. And then this box became small. You can put a piece of paper and travel. And so over the years, basically, this painter was replaced by pixels today, and this really lame optics was replaced by cheaper and good optics. That's all that happened. We replaced the painter and uh, enhanced the hole. So. <laughs> So what is this, the scope of all this? Is to take a picture and show it to somebody, right? That's the only scope. It's, photo it's photography, and you show it to your mom, whoever, friends, what happened. And then, whoops, here. And then suddenly, James Moybridge appears, has the idea that says, if I take 10 cameras and I delay them, I can get uh, an, an impression of, of motion. And, and he got really smart by you know, figuring out that 10 images shows for the first time, and he called it, of course, he was honest, motion picture, which is pictures of something in motion. So however, you know, when you dig deeper, you find out that all these notion of images are absolutely unknown. And, and I record from brains and eyes, and I've never seen an image in my life. So, so it's very interesting that at the periphery of the brain, the sampling is not done on the time axis, but on the amplitude axis. Why? Because this allows you to have an adaptive frequency. If something moves super fast and you're interested by its rate of change, you will get lots of samples. If nothing happens, you get nothing. And, and this is amazing because basically it changes the way we think of information. Now information becomes when is something happening, where, and can I get it as fast as I can so can I process it? And it makes sense, right? If you had to do the other way around, you'd be saying, what do you see? I see the door. I see the thing. I see the thing. And somebody sees something interesting. However, you have to wait for a full round to hear what he is saying. And it takes forever. We would have been decimated by other animals. <laughs> so even base cameras. I spent, I think, 15 years working on this and starting this. So I, in the labs. Now, in labs back in the days, it was Toby and Christoph and a guy called Lee Steiner. And before him, there's a whole people who work to make this thing happen. Cobena here, uh, Ralph and Hopkins. Uh, this, the DVS started everything because it, I have one made by Toby himself. I think it's number two or something. And basically, over the years, now it's flourishing. So many companies are going there. And cameras are becoming a commodity. And I, I the main difference are really they are good and bad, of course. But I mean, they are good. <laughs> they are all good. And so, what you're interested in is basically what's the main difference? What what camera would I need? In principle, the only thing you need is precise timing. That's all I'm saying. And 
if you really want something good, you would look for something that gives you an initial image if you like to show something to somebody. But gray levels are really not compulsory for computation. I've wrote over 80 papers on event-based computation, and I think I used gray levels five times. You can do everything with the timing. And you would look for something that gives you this really nice precision of events, because that's where basically everything lies. And then if you can get gray levels asynchronously and not from a, it's even better, because then you're really <coughs> asynchronous and, and, and perfect. So why are these cameras going to change the world? Which I believe they will, I mean, sooner or later. It's because anyone who designed a computer vision algorithm knows that his main problem is it's going to work in the lab. Once he goes outside, he's dead. And the other problem is as soon as you start moving fast, this is the same scene observed by a conventional camera and event-based camera. And you see motion blur is a, is a killer app. You can't, you, can't, you can't really do anything. If you have blur, you have blur. I'm not talking about the huge waste of information there. Most of these things you're getting are useless. Here, you're only getting the change. Now, the same scene. Here, you're operating the relative change. Here, you have to make a, a decision. Am I integrating short or long? So lots of problem. No surprise, this was not meant to do any form of computation. And no wonder the brain is using this. So here is a full example. Dynamic range is really huge. And you can see here this traffic light. These cameras are 1,000 times supposedly faster than biology. It's not really true. But you can get the flickering of any light source. And you can basically say, oh, from those set of events, there's a traffic light. And you see, you can see inside the tunnel, outside the tunnel, face the sun, see around the sun. It's really nice. So the other main thing is the amount of data you get. This is a time zero image. This is one of the cameras and one that was developed in my lab until recently. And basically, every event comes with its gray level, and this thing is updated here. The most important part is the amount of data you get from a 30 frames per second camera and the amount of data for the same scene from something that runs a million times faster, even though I think it's around 10,000 times or 100,000 times faster. But still, I mean. So when you see this, and you see that you're independent from lighting condition, you understand that you are able to process in real time at a very, very low power budget, provided you do one thing, which is think in the time domain, which nobody out there knows how to do. Because when you talk about computer vision, one, one of the first paper I sent around uh, the end of the year 2000 was, so you're telling us you want to do computer vision without images, without gray levels. Yes, and, and anyway, so. So there must be a big change. So I think to really summarize, this is a driving car. And this is the amount of car. This is what the car is seeing. And this is the amount of data you get from a VGA sensor. Look here. It's around 300, 200 events. And this is a 30, the amount of data you get from a, a 30 frame per second camera. It's way logs unit above. It's unbeatable. So you understand that if you want to make, take advantage of this, your only chance is to operate on these events as they come. One update, one event, one update, one event, one update. Massively parallel, you're going to burn less power, you're going to be fast. But it takes time to think about it. right? But once you find the solution, it's normally the best one. There are not 10,000 ways to operate with time. <coughs> so I have no authority to say, what is not event-based computation, but based on everything I told you, I can tell you that I see some stuff. I don't know this guy. I put him, I put his face all over the place. I have nothing against him. <laughs> and I feel guilty because I think my name appears on the first paper who did this. But from events, you can somehow approximate gray levels. All right? So some people take events and try to take a frame out so spending lots of energy, sometimes GPUs, thousands of watts to enter a deep net. Which you, did you see that curve that sends you 200 events per second or per, per millisecond? Or all these memory that people are allocating to do event, deep event-based networks are empty. 99% of these things are empty. 
So of course, this backdrop, it's easy to look for your keys where your light is, but this is never going to be the answer. It doesn't. You understand? You're losing everything here. So you have to feed a frame. You have to allocate all this, where you're only playing with very small things here and there. So, so to me, I mean, no critic. This is like the invention of the car. You know, you're giving a car, you remove the engine, and you go back to your horses. You see? This is, I think this picture summarizes all. So <laughs> you can have a Ferrari, and you, know, you end up with a donkey there. Anyway, so <laughs> now, why I think neuromorphic engineering is fantastic, and what is my definition of neuromorphic engineering the way I see it, it is the only opportunity for us as a science, as a discipline, to go back to what is noble science. So my lab records from brains and eyes. I trained as a physiologist to do that. We do models from that. We build hardware from that. And we go back to some applications. The main one, I mean, I've done many applications, but this is a nice one because I heard about it today. We've designed with this type of sensor three generations of retinal implant and brain implant because these cameras speak the language of the brain. So you can go back to the brain, speak to the brain, decode brains. And you can also, because you have a better model, you know what you're doing. You can go to robotics and everything. And sometimes by writing the equations, you can go back and say, this thing cannot do that thing without this approach. It's impossible. So you can. You can really sketch experiments. And this is one of the reasons why I moved to the US, because I can have my own primate lab now, which is really hard in Europe. So one example, I don't know how familiar you are. It's, I think it's the simplest. You want to do stereo. Everybody gave up, in real time at least. because And so you have those Kinect that try to solve the match. The match is hard. It's really hard. So in the event-based cameras, Basically, if you take two minutes to think about this problem, so how am I going to do stereo? Well, it's simply a coincidence detection. If something is moving out there, there must be two pixels who are firing at the same time. You get the idea. You can enhance it. You can uh, make it better. But the, the core idea is coincidence detection. And the other core idea that I'll show you later is coincidence detection with delays. And basically, all the 80 papers we, we wrote over the last decade can be summarized as delays, coincidence, coincidence with delays. <laughs> That's it. This is real time. This is the fastest stereo. Something is happening. I'm slowing it down two times, three, four times. Every dot is a 3D point. These are the two cameras. It's calibrated. You know, I did computer vision for many years. So you see, basically, it's a hand. It's a cube thrown in the air, and somebody is grabbing it. And this is the latest thing. This is a depth map shown for every event that is colored according to where he is, how far he is. And this is over a kilohertz uh, application on, at very, very low power. There's nothing magic. It's really simple. And, and so. Another thing that is straightforward, optical flow is the essence of this camera, motion. When you have a super nice temporal resolution, it means you'll be able to measure things precisely. And because you have pixels, guess what? Velocity is the best thing you can measure. Everything you do with these sensors turn out to be velocity-like. So here I have several bars moving at different speeds. And if you look wisely at the data, and not trying to hammer the old equation onto this or create frames, you see that because you have such a beautiful and high temporal resolution, the velocity is going to span a plane, right? Plane of motion. And you guess, look, this thing is slow, so it's, it's going to be a steep plane. This thing is super fast, it's going to be quite a flat plane. So if you write the equations, you know, you see these three thread planes, you say, OK, how, where is velocity? So simply, when you look at the surface of those events and you derive, you find that with the simple, derivation of the surface of event, you get the optical flow. Meaning you can compute the optical flow in real time for every incoming event without the use of GPU, without training a convolutional network, just by doing two simple operations, right? Which is absolutely fantastic. And there are many papers above this. You can even correct for the flow. It's, you don't need to get the normal flow. 
but you can really correct it. There are many nice things you can do because of this temporal precision. A sample example, people love to write papers about flow, but honestly, uh, it always turns out to this thing I told you about the slope. Whether you project that slope on a plane where you want to do all the fancy math, if the camera is perfect, or they are actually the latest models, you're going to get those arrows for free. This is a bounce bouncing slowed down 20 times, so you can see that flow. So now, this is a setup we used, used to use in Paris before I uh, relocated. So you can put the camera, you can have a, a projection system that you see here that sends uh, a, a video to an array. This array is full of electrodes. And the retina, the biological retina, is the most approachable part of the brain. You can take it out, put it there, shine whatever you want on it, and you get the spikes out. And it takes you, it's very, it's quite straightforward to train. And so we said if these algorithms are right, I should be able to make it work on real data. So what you see, we pass bars, simple bars. This is a real neural activity from ganglion cell. Most of them are parasol. And you see that when you apply the algorithm, it really works. It's simple. So you can craft a neural network that interfaces itself with the real spike and just computes the flow. It's straightforward. And you see here are every dot is every neuron. This is the receptive field of the neuron, meaning what portion of the image is he seeing. And you can see that you can really compute the flow. In red is the real one, and in black is uh, the estimated flow. Some are really badly estimated because, unfortunately, we took a, a small piece of the retina, and this guy has no neighbors, so you cannot compute anything. OK, so as you can see, you can, I think, I hope, we've been, myself and all my group, it's quite a large group it used to be, we rewrote most of the computer vision, things that people thought cannot be, have been abandoned, like this is called the pictorial model, it's you. You assemble many small trackers with springs, and you can really update the springs in real time on a mobile phone and detect a face. This is face detection. So guess what? You want to do face detection. I mean, you can train a network. You can use, of course, spatial. I'm not saying there's nothing in spatial information. But there is a universal feature that nobody can grasp with an image, which is your eye blinks. You're all eye blink 5 to 20 times per second. And that has a very unique dynamics. And finally, there's a big hype. I don't know why. I never understood. But for SLAM, and you can, this is a real SLAM with event per event, updating the equations with no common filter. And, uh, and there are many nice outcome and beautiful equations here in the time domain. By the way, here you're following every event in time. You can really track everything. So, so it's really bit computer vision and beyond. Now, going to machine learning, we also inquired a lot. There's a whole suite of papers about this notion of time surfaces. So what is a time surface? Basically, when you want to learn, you want a descriptor of any form. You can smash time, do binary frames, and feed them to a convolution network that won't buy you anything but good results on a paper. But truth is, when a spike comes, these are several pixel lines. When a spike comes, you want to know the best descriptor, because you're in the time domain, is how far in the past something happened. What's, what's the shape of the environment around me in the time domain? And so you add some decay. You choose your favorite decay function. And when this last spike comes, you see what's the amount of decay left around you. And when you draw it, it gives you a time surface. And this time surface basically represents the temporal activity around you in space. And the most important parameter is this decay. How far in the past am I looking to see who spiked when I spiked? And is there a video? No. So imagine you consider this small neighborhood. This is no image, right? The world is dynamic. This 8 is moving for some reason because you're reading it or whatever. And you, you get time surfaces out of it. Each time you get a spike, you compute the time surface. And then this machine learning, it's called a hierarchy of event-based time surfaces, is basically choose your best clustering or correlation or whatever and just pick up the 4 or n most representative time surfaces that are coming. 
and that you're generating with a small uh, decay, meaning you really are observing what's happening on a small time window, like two milliseconds, five milliseconds. So these time surfaces, see, for this eight that is moving upward, this time surface replies here, this one here. See, they try to specialize. Choose your best method. Now here's where it's becoming interesting. Now suppose you've learned your first layer, a time surface arrives, you see which one it matches, and then you release another spike. Same information. But this time you're observing on longer time scale. And you do the same thing again. So now these time surfaces are not telling you what's happening here. They're telling you how these features combine over time. And you can increase your, your time scale again. So this here is getting more specialized. And if you keep going, you will end up having one neuron responding to one thing, right? And there is a, and also you can increase space, also larger receptive field. And so this thing, you don't even need to, to make the artificially reduced number of features, they are going to reduce. Because you know, regularity out there are not that many. Okay, so how, how much time do I have I left? Six months, perfect. So I had many slides here, but I removed them. I was afraid I was going to be too short. So uh, there's the renaissance now of event-based computation. People thought we can hammer here, and you know the story. You heard it all week. There's the promise that this brain is going to give us some beautiful architecture. And it's all based. Today, he's the enemy, actually. If you look in the past, he didn't really invent the architecture, it was many people, but he was the most visible guy. And uh, I if he was alive, he would say, I didn't do it. <laughs> and, uh, and so what's the story there? So I spent lots of, I mean, I'm in this field for a long time, and I, I looked at all these boards and people that are being built, and I went back. You, when you're in France, you teach and you have lots of time. And, <laughs> back in the days, and it looked to me like every generation, this is McCulloch and Pete or Rosenblatt, every generation, at some point, the engineer left his office, went to see a guy who was pinging neuron, pinching neuron, and said, what do you know about that? So everybody used what he knew, what they knew about neurons at their time. So you see here it's 43, you know, 58, and then 70s. And this is basically the first uh, deep net. And it turns out that today, and even in the 80s when backprop was invented, people were building this accelerator in PCI. I've seen one working. I did my thesis in P at Paris 6 right after this hype. And um, anyway, so, you know, and today. So I think, Three minutes. of course. Can I go over time by two minutes? OK, I will. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the, the main problem people are facing with this event-driven uh, spiking is how do you represent any quantity? Right? You have a spike, then what? Are you going to do rate and count spikes? I don't think that's the case. I don't see that happening in biological tissue. So the quest went from looking to how numbers are encoded. I really urge you to read this paper. It's nice. It's from Stan de N about how we have num neurons that encode numbers. But this is a dead end. It's a very cognitive approach. This is not how we compute. And so the idea that seemed obvious to me, because I work in the retina, is that precise timing is important. Delays are important. So this is the simplest neuron a circuit to encode a number. You have one neuron, two neurons, two lines, two delays. You make this guy fire. He will make this guy fire once. He will make the guy fire twice. This timing here is a number, right? And your, your precision is huge because you assume that you know, there's um, you know, high precision. Anyway, so, and then when you gather everything we know, we know that spikes are not binary. Anyone who records from a real piece of tissue knows that there are some dynamics. So here is an exercise of style Unmated. called stick. Unmated. OK. <laughs> <laughs> And basically, the idea is you can send a spike, but it's not. It takes time to integrate. The membrane potential is integrating slowly. Now, here's where you're going to get scared, because I have 40 slides to go. No, no, it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> and when you start playing with this, see you have two numbers, and you want to find the maximum. You can find a small network that combines delays and time. 
you can you know, make a memory. There's a poster out there. coming to the conclusion now. I am. Okay. A subtractor. You can do everything. Linear operation. You have a set of operations, right? And you can compute. So basically, I'm finishing. Don't worry. <laughs> basically, you have an instruction set where you can take your favorite code and, and, and send it to any, any neural network. Last but not least, <laughs> Here is uh, one, uh, um, it's the optical flow computation generated by this framework. So here you see uh, events, here is the arrow, and here is the receptive field, and you see it really looks like uh, GCAMP. Okay. Really nice. And, and? <laughs> <laughs> enough, enough. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was fun. Okay. Thank you. No, no time for a question, sorry. Um, 